Hello, my most beloved and murderous horde, and welcome back. I am, of course, your mistress of murder, Lady Kempo, and you all by now know my son, Charlie. Say hello, Charlie. Firstly, my most beloved and murderous horde, I would like to apologize to you all for the blood and gore, or therefore lack of, that has graced this channel, and I do so hope that this little video makes up for it. Oh, without further to do, you know the drill by now, my lovelies. Pick your poison, sit back, relax, and let's have ourselves a little conversation. Despite its reputation around the world, Canada, like any other country, has its fair share of serial killers. Now, the Great White North crop of these devious fiends are indicative of the region and involve everything from farms to inner cities as the backdrops for these slayings. Here are the top seven most infamous Canadian serial killers to date. Number one is Paul Bernando. Now, Paul operated primarily out of East Toronto City, Scarborough, with his wife, Carla. He was known as the Scarborough Rapist, as well as the Schoolgirl Killer, and sometimes used the alias as Paul Jason Teal. It is estimated that Paul committed numerous rapes and attempted rapes. He was eventually questioned by the police, but they let him go without pressing charges. Paul then moved his attention, with the help of his wife, to a series of rapes and murders between the years of 1990 and 1992. Now, these crimes usually involved him raping a girl while his wife videotaped it. In all, three murders were proven, one of which was Carla's own sister, Tammy. Now, Paul and Carla were both arrested in 1993. Now, while Paul was convicted and given a life sentence in prison, his wife, however, made a plea deal and was charged with the lesser crime of manslaughter, for which she only served a short 12 years in prison. Carla was released in 2005 and somehow has managed to remarry. Number two on our list is a name that I'm sure you, my most murderous horde, will remember quite well, as it truly wasn't all that long ago that this man appeared on the channel. A Mr. Robert Picton has returned to us. You may know him better as Robert William Picton, or Willie, who was born October 24th in 1949 in Portland, Quaquim. Now, he was captured for his crimes in 2002. Now, the scope of his killings is still unknown exactly. He was charged with six murders, but confessed to 49, with an undercover agent masquerading as another inmate. Picton and his brother were multi-millionaires operating a pig farm in their hometown. He also started a non-profit charity named the Piggy Palace Good Time Society. He even converted a former slaughterhouse into a dance club and began holding raves there in the 90s. On any given night, he would have upwards of 2,000 people, including prostitutes and members of the Hells Angels biker gang. After his arrest, a $70 million excavation unearthed the remains of dozens of women. There was also evidence that he may have ground up his victims and then fed them to his pigs. This resulted in a public health warning in the Providence. Picton was convicted in 2007 and is currently serving a lifetime imprisonment. Number three is Russell Johnson. Born in 1947, Russell Johnson became known as the Bedroom Strangler during the 70s. He raped and killed a number of women in Ontario, 
but when the victims were identified, it was deemed that they had simply died in their sleep. You see, Johnson would climb the sides of buildings and wait for his victims to fall asleep while watching them for hours. He would then commit his acts of atrocity, murder them, and make them look like they were merely sleeping. In addition to the three murders he was charged with, he admitted to seven more, as well as 17 other attacks. Now, in 78, he was actually found not guilty by reason of insanity and was put in the Oak Ridge Mental Health Center, a maximum security facility. Number four is Clifford Olson Jr. Now, Olson, born in 1940 in Vancouver, British Columbia, became known as the Beast of British Columbia. Over the course of a year in 1980 and 1981, he killed 11 children and teenagers between the ages of 9 and 18. His standard method of operation was to kidnap his victim, rape them, then either strangle, stab, or bludgeon them to death. The major factor about these killings is in fact that they took place in a very short span of time, reaching their peak in July of 81 when he killed six in the month. He was apprehended in August of that same year and struck a plea deal. Now, the interesting thing about this case is what that plea deal actually was. You see, $10,000 would be put into a trust fund for his wife and child for each body he helped law enforcement recover. He was paid for the first 10 and gave the 11th body as a freebie. How generous. The man still made off with about a hundred grand. Now, while there was a plethora of very understandable public outcry about the payoff, Olson was nevertheless found guilty and sentenced to life in prison. He also scored a 38 out of the 40 possible points on the psychopathic scale. Now, that wouldn't be so interesting if the standard cutoff wasn't 25 to 30. Number 5 is, and I'm not joking about this name, Peter Woodcock. He was born in 1939, and he later changed his name to, again, not joking, David Michael Kruger while in prison. Now, Peter was born to a 17-year-old woman and was given up for adoption almost immediately. He went from home to home, finally settling in at age three. Despite this, he was poorly adjusted in school and made no friends. His foster parents attempted analysis and even put him in special schools, but he was generally quiet and appeared to be rather obsessive with his foster mother. By age 16, he would continuously drive his bicycle around various parts of Toronto with what he believed to be an army of 500 invisible boys on bikes. He sexually assaulted and murdered three children aged from four to nine. In his most horrific act, he molested a four-year-old girl and killed her by forcing a tree branch into her sexual organs. Now, Peter was eventually found not guilty by reason of insanity in 1957 and then was sent for treatment, which included LSD therapy. For years, doctors tried to work with him to improve his condition, this, however, was all but abandoned when he believed that an alien-led gang known as the Brotherhood would help him if he killed a former inmate. Now, in Canada's great wisdom of all of this, he was actually given a weekend pass where he then murdered and sodomized this poor man before turning himself back in. Well, at least he has the Canadian politeness. Number six is Gilbert Paul Jordan, also known as the Boozing Barber, born in 1931, had a very unique murder method. He used alcohol to kill his victims. 
operating in the Vancouver area from 1965 to 2004. An extraordinary long killing spree, if you ask me. Now, Jordan would go to bars and pick up Aboriginal women and bring them back to his hotel room. There, he would offer them money for sex and then proceed to drink extreme levels of alcohol with them. It is said that he actually drank at least 50 ounces of alcohol per day, so he was able to drink to the point where his victim passed out. He is then said to have then poured more alcohol down their throat, and they would die of alcohol poisoning. Eh, that or drowning. Now, the police were unable to fully identify this as murder, so the only time Jordan was charged of anything was for a manslaughter case in 1988. He served a measly six-year prison sentence and was released. Now, while part of his conditional release was to abstain from alcohol use and to avoid women who consumed alcohol, it is widely believed that he continued his behavior until his death in 2006. And number seven, Alan Langier, born in 1948. Alan was convicted of his first murder in 86. Along with two others, he beat to death a man and seriously injured the man's wife. In 1989, he complained to the prison staff about an ear infection and was then transferred to a hospital. He used a handmade key to pick the handcuffs and had a TV antenna that he used to beat the guards. Lungier escaped the grounds and stole cars to make a getaway. Over the course of the next seven months, he evaded capture and established himself as the monster of Miraccia, where he then committed four more murders and arson, burning down the home of two of his victims. His last murder was that of a priest. He was finally captured and convicted in 1991. It was the first criminal case in Canada to use DNA fingerprinting in prosecution. Nanjir is serving life in prison but for some reason had the opportunity for parole after 25 years, which would be, if my math is correct, as of last year, he was eligible for parole and could very well be walking free at this very moment in the Great White North. And that, my most beloved horde, is all the time I have for you tonight. And remember, my lovelies, haunting dreams, and blessed be.